Everyone's life has to end. That's one of the guarantees of existence, at least at this point. There are a lot of ways that people leave this world. Most are relatively peaceful, such as passing in their sleep. However, some aren't so lucky. Today, I'll be covering some of the darkest final images that I could find. This one gets heavy, so be cautious moving forward. Follow my social media and thank you for watching. Let's go. The Tasman Sea is a 2,000 kilometer body of water that stretches between Australia and New Zealand. Many people have crossed over this body of water to travel between the two countries. However, none have done it on kayak. At that moment, I really honestly did not want him to go and I just wanted to hold on to him. I wonder if I'm doing this. I really am. And I don't have an answer. Andrew was forced to abandon this attempt, but weeks later, he set off again. On January of 2007, Andrew McCauley decided to try his second attempt at crossing the Tasman Sea from Australia to New Zealand. Being someone that had already successfully performed other sea kayaking expeditions, he was no stranger to this type of travel and the risks that come with it. Over the next month, Andrew would travel across the Tasman Sea. This photo is one of many that Andrew took as he documented his journey across the sea. Due to the sunscreen, it may seem a bit eerie, but in reality, he was likely in pretty decent spirits. During this time, he faced many challenges from the intense weather conditions that the sea could create. At times, the kayak would even capsize and he would have to get out and push it upright to save himself. He was extremely resilient, to say the least. Despite these challenges, he was making good progress and was making his way towards New Zealand. As he got closer and closer to his destination of Milford Sound, New Zealand, it seemed like there would be no way that he would fail. Most wouldn't even have made it this far. However, we all know that something had to go wrong. On February of 2007, Andrew would send a distress call as he quickly realized that he wouldn't make it to his destination that was only 56 kilometers or 34 miles away. A search was immediately began, however after days of searching, only Andrew's partially flooded kayak would be recovered. Even now, his body has never been found, and it's unknown what truly happened to him. It's more than likely that he passed away, however, as if he did somehow swim to New Zealand, I would guess that they would have discovered him while he was trying to make it there. Even if he didn't touch the land, I think we can all say that Andrew actually did make it across the Tasman Sea in just a kayak. May he rest in peace. On December 26, 2004, this image was taken. In it, you can see what looks like a wave crossing over the land as it even reaches the height of one of the palm trees in front of it. That would already make this image morbid enough, but it gets worse. This isn't just any tsunami. It's actually one of the most devastating disasters in modern history. Off of the coast of Sumatra Island, a powerful 9.1 magnitude sea quake would erupt, causing a 900 mile, or 1,448 kilometer, fault line to form where the Indian and Australian tectonic plates meet. This also caused the ocean floor to instantly rise by as much as 40 meters, or 131 feet. This sudden rise would of course trigger a massive tsunami. It wouldn't be long until these massive waves began to hit Indonesia on the island of Aceh. These first waves would end up ending the lives of 100,000 people. Soon the waves would crash over Thailand, India, Sri Lanka, and even South Africa. By the time the tsunami was done, 230,000 lives had been lost. You can only wonder what happened to the people in this photo, and if any of them had survived. Based on the numbers, it's more than likely that only one or two of them did. The most terrifying part about this is that they couldn't have predicted that this disaster would have happened. They were more than likely having a regular day right before this moment, and now suddenly all of their lives were in extreme danger. Danger that they have no way to control or avoid. Rest in peace to all of the lives lost and condolences to all affected. There are around 45,000 domestic flights in the United States every day. Despite that amount, you probably have noticed that you don't hear about many crashes or catastrophic accidents at all. In fact, in 2021, there were only 176 air traffic fatalities worldwide. It's not very common that you would actually pass away from an airplane accident, especially commercial. Of course, uncommon doesn't mean never. After the hard facts of disaster, the hard questions. The hard facts are these. A United Airlines DC-10 with 293 people aboard 
crashed yesterday while attempting an emergency landing at Sioux City, Iowa. Amazingly, at last count, 184 people survived. And now the hard question, why did the plane crash? On a typical flight from Denver to Chicago, a McDonnell Douglas DC-1010 would make a shallow right turn, something that the plane had done thousands of times before. However, this time, the result would be different. There was actually a microscopic issue in the titanium alloy fan disc that over the years had formed into a sizable crack. During the turn, the fan disc of the tail-mounted engine would disintegrate, and this would subsequently cause the fan disc to rip out of the aircraft, taking parts of the number two hydraulic system and supply hoses in the process. In other words, it was almost impossible to control the plane now. That wouldn't stop Alfred Haynes, Bill Records, Dudley Vorak, and Dennis Fitch from trying though. Although the typical method of using the control column was useless, after trial and error they were able to figure out that if they idled the left wing mounted engine and applied maximum power on the right, they could at least get the plane to level out. Eventually the plane would enter fugoid cycles, a phenomenon in which a plane will climb before descending over and over, changing the speeds as it does so. With every cycle, the plane would lose around 1,500 feet or 460 meters of altitude. Dennis Fitch was able to use the throttles to mitigate the cycle. Eventually, they would arrive at the Sioux Gateway Airport and were preparing to land. As they were rapidly approaching the runway, they were at a speed of around 250 miles per hour or 410 kilometers an hour, which was much higher than the speed required for a safe landing. The aircraft began to roll to the right and the engines were responding in time to Fitch's commands to stop the roll. After hitting the ground, flipping, and rolling over, Flight 232 would rest in a cornfield close by. In the end, 112 out of the 292 people on board would pass away. Despite the horrendous conditions, somehow the crew was able to save the majority of the people on board, which is amazing. Rest in peace to the 112 lives lost. They stand in the windows, these survivors, looking out over a countryside so peaceful that one could hardly imagine a disaster here. But it did happen and these men and women and children will never forget it. Stand on my knees, you already know my capital, capital stays. Those of you who listen to rap may know of a rapper called Capital Steez, otherwise known as Stilo, King Stilo, King Capital, and by his government name, Courtney Everill Jamal Dewar Jr., Steez would begin rapping in 2008 at the age of 15 as a part of a group called The Third Kind. A few years later, Steez would form the rap group Pro Era with Powers Pleasant, a record producer. This group would include a lot of talented rappers, including Joey Badass, a close friend of Steez. This would also be the person that would make the song Survival Tactics with Steez, a song that currently has 25 million views on YouTube. Later that same year, he would release American Corruption, an extremely highly acclaimed album that would cause even more eyes to fall on him. As the year continued, Steez continued to succeed, and everything was looking up for his career and future as a phenomenal artist. However, on December 23rd, 2012, Steez would release this tweet which simply said, The End. Right after releasing this tweet, Steez would jump off of the top of the Cinematic Music Group headquarters and would not survive. This final tweet is an extremely unnerving sentiment of someone that knew their time was coming. However, Steez also had other very strange tweets. Steez had gotten into spiritual and metaphysical theories during high school and would end up believing in other spiritual practices and aspects like Egyptian mysticism, numerology, astral projection, and the Indian chakra system. As you can see by the tweets, he also believed he was a being that existed on a higher dimensional plane and held the belief that he was an indigo child. This meaning that he was someone who has supernatural abilities and can possess these traits or qualities. This would cause people on Reddit to theorize that he may have possessed schizophrenia with one person stating, the way he leaks 47 with Doomsday. He talks to his friends about it and no one ever suspects. He was eager and ready to go, and no one knew how deep that really went until it was too late. That's the worst thing. It was under everyone's noses the entire time, but there was nothing anyone could have done to stop it. My ex-roommate has schizophrenia, and from a completely untrained eye, Steez's death and circumstances remind me a lot of what my roommate had going on before getting prescribed some really heavy antipsychotics. When someone plans their death that far in advance, it would probably point to some sort of mental imbalance or illness. It's not fun to think about, but if there's anything I've learned from dealing with this kind of stuff, there's not much you can do. You can sit back and blame yourself that it happened and you feel like you could do more, but most of the time, it's very unexpected until you see the signs while looking back. Hindsight is 2020. Others even believe that he didn't actually do anything to himself. It's hard to say exactly why what happened happened, but 
Either way, it's still a tragic loss of a very talented person that brought entertainment and joy to a lot of people. May Capital Steez rest in peace. Overworking is an issue that many face. Sometimes this is for school, but other times this is for an occupation. While some of us may barely be able to manage to work consistently for a few hours, others can do it for days on end without rest. However, humans need to sleep. A lack of sleep causes many health issues, but mainly in this case I'm talking about exhaustion. Things like coffee and energy drinks can combat this, however. When done in moderation, these drinks usually don't cause any serious issues. But when you overdo it, it can cause irreversible consequences. Mita Diran, an Indonesian copywriter, would tweet this on December 14, 2013. It wouldn't be long, however, until the effects of overworking and intense energy drink consumption would take their toll on her. In other tweets on her page, you can see how much she was forced to work for her company, commenting at times that she was working over 12 hours at the office. Her company would later come out and tweet their condolences, which of course received a lot of negative attention. It's sad that anyone is forced to work so much that they end up losing their life, although that much is obvious. It's even more morbid, however, that there likely wasn't much of a choice whether she would end up this way or not. Rest in peace to her, and the same goes to everyone else mentioned in this video.